Okay, we are right on schedule. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Again, I just wanna thank everybody for signing up today. Um, I'm Hannah Baldwin. I'm the firm administrator at Smith Marion and Company and I'll be your host. Um, we were super excited to partner with Tara for this event. Um, this is all happening because of them. Um, Paul Dellinger and Maria Catrone just really wanted to put on something for you guys because you guys have been such great members. And unfortunately, some events have had to be canceled over the past year um, due to obviously COVID and things shutting down. But hopefully things seem to kind of be turning around. Things are starting to slowly open back up again. And I know that you know everybody's ready and excited about being able to meet again, um, hopefully sooner than later. Um, but now they didn't want to keep you waiting. They definitely wanted to put on this event um, and they did that for free for you guys. And so, yes, I'll be providing the slides afterwards and I will be providing the recording. So if there was anybody who wasn't able to make it, maybe because they were at the beach or maybe because they had a vacation, um, no worries, um, you'll be able to watch this afterwards. Um, a couple of different things about Zoom. I know everybody is very used to Zoom, but um, in case you're not familiar, there's a Q&A at the very top of your screen. If you click that, you can enter questions in there's also a chat function. So if you put your question in chat, we'll still see it. Um, it's just a little bit better for you to put it in the Q&A. And we'll be doing some polls during the presentation. If a poll pops up, you can just answer it. It's super easy. If you don't see a poll, it's because we're not doing one. And we'll have a break um, at 10.05 for about five minutes. And then we'll get back and we'll go into how to report CARES funds and then go into final questions and wrap up. I have with me today, Chad Porter and Doug Engelhart. They are both um, partners at Smith Marion and Company and CPAs. They are experts in housing authorities and they work primarily doing housing authority audits. So um, a lot of you are very familiar with Smith Marion, but in case you aren't, we are a, in a, we're an accounting firm. We are based in California and in Tennessee and we travel all across the United States. And we have some clients that we go to overseas um, we focus on primarily housing authority and nonprofit audits. Um, we also do tax returns as well. So today we're gonna to be talking mostly about accounting, but we're gonna keep it as interesting and exciting as possible. Um, you'll be learning about RAD reporting and accounting and um, how to report the CARES funds. And with that being said, I'm gonna be handing it over to Chad and he'll be taking over for us. Morning, everybody. Uh, you're probably familiar with, you know, the speakers. Uh, if you're an audit client, you've probably seen both of us at one time or another. Um, myself and uh, Doug Englehart. Uh, Doug's now in the California office. Uh, he, he got up early this morning to join everybody. And we imported uh, Hannah in for the, the week. She's out here in Tennessee, but she's generally out there in, in California. Um, but we're very familiar with um, these two items. Um, and as we're each speaking, I'm gonna speak on the first part today. Doug's on the Q&A side. So if you have questions, throw them up there because he's on there watching those. And when Doug's speaking, I'll be on the Q&A side. So if you have questions, throw them up there. We got the experts looking at them. He'll um, interrupt me if it's not gonna be in the slides um, and try to get me to answer those questions as we're going. So today I'm gonna talk about RAD because everyone asks a million questions about RAD. It's very confusing. So if you're confused, don't feel bad. So is everybody else, including HUD, sometimes even us. Uh, so we're gonna start off with the poll question. Where are you in your RAD process? Um, have you not started? Maybe you're not considering it. Um, maybe you're started it. You got the application in. Maybe your CHAPS has been awarded. Um, maybe you're right there at the end. You're all about to close it. Or some of you are done. And some of you might be sitting there going, huh, what's RAD? <laughs> <laughs> feel free to mark any of those. Uh, you may not have a clue what I'm talking about when I say RAD. Um, that's fine. We'll, we'll explain it to you. Uh, but I'm pretty sure if you've been in housing for the last five years, you've heard that, that term at least a million times. So uh, I'll let Hannah tell you when it's closing, but they're going to do the poll real quick. I'm going to give you guys about 20 more seconds. It looks like almost everybody has their votes in. Just to make sure everyone's awake first thing this morning. I'm not talking to, you know, a dead screen. Okay. So it looks like not started. 
and done tied wow so <laughs> it's about 50 50 in that room there we got people who basically haven't started or we got people who have completely finished it so that's interesting i got a couple that are pretty close to being done and then chaps okay so at least nobody didn't know what rad was that's good uh so we'll start from there and work our way through all right, so the focus today we're going to go over, um, I try to present this different than other places. So first I'm going to focus on the accounting because that's what we do and that's what I want to focus on. So what the program is going to look like and how your participants are going to be eligible and different things like that is not my focus. Um, there's plenty of the training on that. This is focusing on what's the accounting going to look like because it's pretty complex and a lot of times it gets really confusing. Um, I try to do fair and balanced. I tell anyone who asks me which one's better, PBRA, PBV. <laughs> depends, you know, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of scenarios. There's good and bads on each one of them. And I try to be impartial and tell you that, you know, you need to look at these and pencil them out and see which one works out better for you. Uh, also on this thing, I'm not just going to focus on large or just small housing authorities. I'm going to try to give it to you so you can see what it looks like from on both sides. So, so the larger housing authorities um, and what a smaller housing authority is going to look like. A lot of times the smaller housing authorities get ignored. So I'm going to try to make sure I address um, small housing authorities questions. And then answer those looming questions because, you know, I know I get a phone call probably once a month about somebody getting ready to do RAD or I heard about RAD and I have questions. And so try to answer a lot of those so you have that information here at your fingertips and unconfuse you the best I can because I'm confused sometimes on this stuff too. So my first question I always ask people a lot of times when we go to audit clients if they're not doing rad we just ask them you know what's holding you back why are you not looking at it um, what's your fear what are you afraid of in rad um, and so if you have those go ahead and throw some of those in the Q and A right now um, so we can try to address those for you sometimes you know the clients have very good reasons for not doing rad um, sometimes their fears are unwarranted you know they're afraid that. Uh, I'm going to rent this building out and, and a year later, they're all going to go mobile and move away. I'm going to discuss that with you guys in here so that you can kind of get that fear out of your mind. Um, but some of the fears are right. You know, if you're not going to get as much money under RAD as you are under public housing, it kind of tends to say, yeah, we might not want to go RAD at this point in time. Uh, but we'll discuss, you know, why you should consider it. Um, it's not a, once you start looking at it and start down the path, it's not a you're on the road to never, you can't stop. You know, I'll show you plenty of places where you can stop and say, ah, it's not for me, I'm back out. No problem, you can do that. So put those up in the Q&A and we can probably talk about those. That'll save us some time at the end just to kind of address any questions you guys might have. And I can't move the slide. <laughs> um, so a couple things to know about RAD. And a lot of people, these are, I mean, I'm not going to talk politics with anybody about this, but yes, basically RAD is moving everything off public housing onto the Section 8 platform. Um, and that is the goal of HUD. They would like to be on one platform, which would be Section 8. Um, so yes, they are moving towards that. Um, the other part about RAD, the goal is it's going to leverage private capital. Uh, currently under the public housing system, you have a DOT, a, um, I'm sorry, a, a trust on your land that you can't borrow money against it. You can't get private equity into those uh, buildings to refurbish them or you can't borrow money against them other than CFFP, of course, but that's still just borrowing from HUD. Um, so this gives you the ability to go borrow private capital um, getting out of there. So under the RAD, it releases you and, and un unties your hands on that part. And then of course, uh, you know, this is Great for the clients, maybe not uh, the tenants, but maybe not so much for you, but it offers the residents greater choice and mobility. They can they can move if they want to. Uh, public housing was not mobile. You know, you had a unit and that was your unit and, that, and you can't leave that unit. You'd have to go get on another waiting list. Um, we'll talk about mobility and what they get uh, on choices on those items. So that way they can uh, have more mobility and more freedom. Now, Hannah, keep an eye on the time too for me if I need to speed up or slow down. Generally, it's gonna be speed up because I tend to be long-winded on these things. Uh, I'm going to throw these acronyms around a lot, so you might want to write them down, because this is the one and only slide about this stuff, and we're just going to use these acronyms a lot. PBV stands for project-based vouchers. Basically, it's a voucher that's tied to a project-based unit. Uh, it's not a housing choice voucher that can move around with mobility, but it is a voucher in the same sense. So PBV is, think of Section 8 HCV kind of similar. 
And the project-based rental assistance, which we call PBRA, is more like the multifamily housing system. Um, it's more closer, I would say, related to public housing model. And so the rental assistance is um, to that unit. Uh, whatever tenant is living in that unit gets that rental assistance. So make sure you understand those because I will turn not to say those big long items. I'm gonna say PBV or PBRA um, and they made them way too close. <laughs> we should just go V or RA would make life easier but most people will throw those acronyms out. So make sure you got those uh, jotted down. So <clears throat> I always kind of put this slide up there for everybody. So you kind of realize when you were talking about um, for those ones who have not started RAD, um, I, would can, I would encourage you to look into RAD again, because A, they keep changing um, the RAD formula. So if it didn't work three years ago for you, the formula is completely different now. The funding streams are completely different. So um, a good friend of mine, Dale Rector, likes to use the batch of cookies, right? You know, the first batch of cookies was really good. And then according to his story, the second batch of cookies or the second round of RAD, they burnt, they were terrible. So hopefully nobody went in the second round. It was not very um, house, housing authority friendly. Um, but the last couple batches of cookies have getting, they're making the recipe a little sweeter and a little sweeter. And our theory on that is like, well, how long are they gonna keep making that batch sweeter and sweeter until it's past the 50% now? When we get past the 75%, are they gonna start going back to, well, I've got 75% of you already gone rad. There's just a 25% left. How much sweeter are they gonna make the deal so that you'll go? Uh, at what point are they gonna, and we all know HUD, at what point are they gonna say, there's 10% of you left, you gotta go. There's no choice, there's no sweetness, there's no extra chocolate in your cookies. They just gonna force it down your throat. So that's why I say you should look into RAD now and see if it works for you. Again, we're gonna talk about where you can back out at different points, just because you start down the process, um, put the application in, we'll talk about it, you can back out. You get to any point before you sign that deal, we can back out and we'll talk about that as we go along. And then cash management for public housing, you know, they're, they're looking to do what they've done with um, HCV program. They've got to manage that cash. They can't have you sitting on huge reserves. So they're looking at every way to cut those reserves down. And going rad, you take those monies out of public housing. You take those multi-million dollars worth of reserves you've been sitting on for the last 50 years and you put it into a separate entity or you put it into a rad deal. It unties those strings and it's no longer restricted reserve from HUD. Um, you got to structure your deal right, but that's how you can unrestrict that money and get it out of public housing. So that's the other good side of uh, going where at. So either way you go, PBV or PBRA, and those are basically your only two choices. Um, I know there's a different streams, you know, uh, of going that way, but you're either going to be in the PBV system or you're going to be in the PBRA system. Um, either one you choose. These are some of the overall general just good points that you should know no matter which one you choose. We're going to start talking about each one in a second, but for now, overall, no matter what you do, if you go rad, budgeting will be a lot easier because you're going to know exactly how much you're getting for each unit. I've got 50 units. Each one of them is $650 uh, per unit, so you can budget your revenue really easy. In public housing right now, that's not how it works. Um, you don't know how much subsidy you're going to get. You don't know which tenant's going to pay how much. Um, so your revenue is kind of unpredictable on the public housing side, whereas PBV or PBRA, it's going to be very easy to budget. Um, you don't have to be an accountant to do it. It's pretty easy multiplication. And then the expenses, there's not going to be much change there for you, right? They're going to be similar expenses. What was allowable under uniform guidance in public housing, most exact same costs are going to be allowable under PBB or PBRA. Um, either one of those. So that part won't change. Your allowable expenses are going to be very similar. Um, and the other really nice thing is the fungibility is now with all programs. We're going to talk about excess cash. Um, no longer is it between AMPs. Now it's just excess cash. You as the housing authority can decide where it's best to use. Is it best to send it to um, the HCV program? Is it best to send it here? Is it better to go buy another building? There's nothing that says you can't do that. So it does give you that fungibility between all programs inside the housing authority. As long as it stays under that low income housing, you know, mission statement, you can use the money for that stuff. I always tell everyone, you can't take a trip to Tahiti with the board. That's not allowable. But if you want to buy a building down the street um, and put up a non-HUD low income housing and buy two units or buy five units or do a low income housing house flip, you know, where you're going to buy the house and rehab it and sell it to a tenant all that stuff's allowable. You can do that. So it does give you that flexibility. 
So these are the steps you go through to do RAD. And the biggest thing I wanna point out is all those steps along the way, at any point in time, you can back out. So you file your application with RAD and we do something for you and we look at it and we go, ooh, that's not gonna work. Back out right then, no problem. You can get your chap from HUD where they're saying, hey, we approve you to go through RAD. You can back out at that point. Um, you can go get all your debt um, financing secured if you need it. I mean, you might not do any debt security. Um, you have to update your PHA plan. You gotta um, provide your financing plan, get down to the issue and commitment. Uh, that's the point where you're starting to get you know, down to the last point. But when you close that loan or you sign that final document, that's the only point you can't, there's no turn back from there. But before that, anywhere in those steps, you can turn back. You can say, this isn't working. I don't like it. I'm gonna wait for the next batch of cookies. Whatever you wanna say, you can back out. So that's why I always tell them when it doesn't hurt to go every two or three years and look at this again and make sure um, you don't get left uh, on the empty bus at the end. You know, you wanna, you wanna go when the going is good and what works best for your housing authority. So I would say those ones who have not started, you probably wanna at least go look File your application. I mean, I know Paul's probably on here and I've heard him say it before at RAD. It's like, doesn't hurt to file the application. You can back out. <laughs> so go ahead, file the application, start the process, back out if you don't like it. Hey, Chad. Yep. So we got a question um, regarding fungibility. So the question is uh, under fun fungibility, can you donate to a nonprofit to purchase buildings? Um, I would say, is it your nonprofit or is it just some nonprofit down the street? Uh, you don't, you can't take it out of your entity. So, so if it's your nonprofit, sure, you could, you know, let's say you have a housing authority A and housing authority A nonprofit, um, which is a blended component of yours, uh, which he is says, maybe where yeah. the unit is. He says it's a, it's a blended, it's theirs. Yep. Okay. So yeah, there's no problem. You send that money over to that nonprofit, that nonprofit buys the building. Yep. Perfectly acceptable. Thank you, Chad. Uh, sure. So this is the, you know, basically what happens is public housing can go, this is the old kind of slide just to kind of show you what happens, but public housing, you can see can go into PBRA or PBV. Um, the old mod rehab could go both ways also, but the rent support and the wrap could only go one way, could just go PBV. Um, it's just kind of the old way to tell people, but most people we're talking to today, um, all it's really left is the public housing module. Um, some mod rehabs are still left that haven't gone yet, but, um, and that was that first batch of cookies, that first 60,000 units. Um, they've done several batches since then, but you get the choice of going either PBRA or PBV. So this is kind of, this is where we're going to start getting to the accounting stuff. So the non-accounting people, this is where you're going to start falling asleep because we're going to start talking FDS and line items and how everything goes in different columns. Um, and this is where everyone starts getting confused because you have a lot of choices, as you can see across this item here. You've got basically four choices. When you convert to RAD, how do you want to do it? What's your vehicle going to look like? Um, obviously, the simplest and least complex is just taking it and putting it in business activities. Basically the housing authority moves it from column A to column B, out of public housing over to business activities. Still same EIN number, it's still the housing authority that owns this stuff. Um, it's just, now it's not a public housing activity, it's a business activity. Um, and so the PHA continues to own it. Um, and so there's no problems with that one. The only one that causes problems there is if we're trying to do um, PBV, because in PBV as we'll talk about, you have to have three entities, um, the housing authority, um, a contract administrator for the voucher and the tenant, obviously. Um, and those three people can't, none of them can be the same entity. So the problem becomes if you're the housing authority and you're the contract administrator for the voucher program, obviously you can't put your PBV over here in business activity. So basically business activities, we generally say you can't do it. I mean, we can talk if you wanna get into a complex, yes, you can, you could have someone else administer the vouchers, but that's really an in-depth conversation that we'd have to have on a separate side. But generally business activities are gonna be your PBRAs that they don't wanna set up a separate entity. You can also take the PBRA um, and put it in the multifamily housing column. Uh, the multifamily housing column already exists there. Some housing authorities, some of our larger housing authorities already have multifamily programs inside of the housing authority. They would just create another multifamily housing program. Um, just like you can have multiple component units, you can have multiple multifamily housing um, projects that would all be combined into the one column in the FDS. 
Uh, again, this is where the housing authority still owns uh, the assets. Uh, it's still under the EIN. We haven't created another entity. And uh, anyone who's done this knows when we start talking about creating new entities, it's putting on different hats and a lot more discussion. It's a lot more complex. So these first two columns were still housing authority still owns the projects. They have just moved out of public housing and either into the business activities column or they're moving into the multifamily housing column. Um, and so those ones, the trick on the multifamily housing, and we'll talk a lot about it on PBRA, you will have to do two submissions. You'll have to do your famous, you know, React FDS that you're used to. And on top of that, we have to do a multifamily housing submission, which is completely different set of chart of accounts. Um, it's still a balance sheet and income statement, but it's it looks way different. Um, anyone who has ever done one, it's uh, night and day. They don't look anything like each other and they don't line up. Um, so you have to reorganize all your accounts. So my talk here is always about the accounting people and, and, and be aware of what you're doing to your accounting department and what your pressures you're putting on them. Component units, um, that starts where we get to the complex stuff. We start creating component units. Now we have to have a discussion if it's blended, is it discrete? Um, if you don't know what those are, I mean, we can have a discussion about that too, but there's a difference between a blended component unit, which is blended into your financial statements and discreetly presented, which is kind of sitting out there on the edge of your financial statements. Both of them are separately legal entities away from the housing authority, which means they have their own EIN number, which means they have their own filing requirements for taxes. So when you start going down this road, this is where it starts getting complex and people start really getting confused. Um, not to scare you away from it, sometimes you have to go that way. If we're doing project-based vouchers and you have a voucher system, you have to put those entities over in a separate legal nonprofit or profit entity for doing a lie tech. Um, that way you can be the contract administrator and this component unit can hold your assets. Um, the housing authority puts all those, I mean, the whole balance sheet and the income statement go over to this component unit at that point in time. And the last column, I'm just gonna class over because it is an option, but nobody I have seen does this. You could just simply sell off your projects to somebody else um, and be done. Uh, but that'd be like closing down the housing authority. I mean, you might have other projects you're doing that you would still, still be there as a housing authority, but that public housing amp would be gone and done. You would have sold it off and it's off your financial statements. There's no more reporting by you and somebody else is taking it over and using it under PBV or PBRA. Sorry, that's kind of a long slide, but that's what it looks like. So let's talk about each one. So you kind of go, I'm gonna try to do these kind of a little bit quicker. Um, these PBV, so this is project-based vouchers. This means you have a voucher system generally. Um, if you don't have a voucher, you can, uh, HCV system, you can kind of fall asleep during this part because I will, you'll see later in the slides, I'm gonna recommend you do not do this. It's not impossible. I have a housing authority too, who was public housing only and didn't have a voucher system and went this route. Um, I'll tell you all the cons of doing that, but currently if you've got a voucher system and you might consider going on project-based voucher, um, you can either put it like you see off to the left over here is that you can go into a blended component unit, um, you can go and discreetly present it, or the last you know, final one, you could just sell it off and not have it anymore. Um, if you do choose to go the route where you don't have a voucher system, you can do it. You're gonna still retain that asset probably in business activities because you're not the contract administrator for the voucher. So there's no problem with keeping in your business activities. Or you may be doing like my other ones who actually have done this. Um, they're going into like a discreetly presented LIHTC, low income housing tax credit deal. Um, and so basically they're gonna put their assets into a, a discreetly presented component unit. Somebody else is gonna administer the contracts and that's how they're gonna run their system. But most of you are gonna go off to the left over there. You're gonna blend a component unit or discreetly present it. Just depends if you're doing um, tax credit deal or not. Discrete usually is more complex and it's usually if you're doing a tax credit only. If you're not doing tax credit, we're just gonna say go blended. And then this is PBRA, a little simpler. Um, this is the project-based rental assistance. So you can keep it inside the housing authority on the left, which would mean it goes in the multifamily housing column. Uh, no separate EIN number and no other tax returns to file, no more headaches, you know. So if you're a very small uh, 150 unit, you know, public housing only, you may consider just going the multifamily housing route. It will make your life much simpler. We're not creating separate entities. We're not having to do separate tax returns and all this stuff that is kind of confusing to a lot of people. Um, but if you're a larger one and, and you might wanna do some other stuff, I mean, the blended component units have advantages uh, by doing it that way. Um, but you can go blended component unit or you can go, if you're going maybe, you know, PBRAs go tax credit all the time too. Um, so you can put it into a tax credit, um, get private investors to invest in this and, and help with the rehab. 
So you can put it in a discreetly presented component unit. And of course that last one, just we have to put it on there, <laughs> but not on your financial statements, you could just sell it off too. PBRA, you can go PBRA and sell it completely off and not be part of your entity any longer. Hey Chad. Yes. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a lot of clients that do go PBRA, but I had a question as far as um, when you say go multifamily housing, mm -hmm. where on the REAC, is there a specific column that's yeah I, there's a program there's a program for multifamily i don't know the system number off the top of my head doug but there is one it's a 14 point something like i think it's 238 CFDA. Um, okay yeah so that, that's what happened you would add a program multifamily housing that reason it goes in that column is because it's uh, it's not legally separated so it's not if you have a multifamily housing client like i know which one i'm, maybe I'm thinking of uh they have a legal separate entity so that one wouldn't go in the multifamily housing call. Multifamily housing is if it's under the housing authority's EIN right. number, right. and then they're having a multifamily housing program. Uh, if they have okay. a multifamily housing entity, which is a separate right. nonprofit, that would not go in there. You would put it out with the, it would be in the blended component unit column. Okay. All Makes right. sense? Thank you. Yep. Yep. So here's a little bit of a kind of an example of what it will look like. Um, obviously, the year of conversion is the most complex because they're not going to convert nice and neat on your year end. Uh, I wish they would. It would make life easier for us accountants. But no, you know, developers, HUD, and executive directors don't always make it easy on us. They decide, you know, hey, the deal needs to close. Let's close it. And it's the middle of our year. So here in this example, this housing authority converts to RAD middle, middle of the fiscal year end. First nine months are under public housing. And we close three months before year end. We're going PBV. Um, so what happens is on the day of closing, which is on that ninth month, so starting our 10th month, we close our deal and we need to move the balance sheet at the last month. Let's just make them a December year end. So let's say, because it makes my work, my brain work easier. September 30, we close. We're going to have to do these entries um, to move the balance sheet. And this is showing you what the income statement will look like. The income statement, the first nine months stay in public housing. So you still have operating subsidy for those first nine months and you have your normal expenses for those nine months. The last three months, you still receive public housing subsidy because um, the voucher doesn't kick in until the beginning of December. So you've got these vouchers. I mean, you're not getting any voucher money, even though you've converted to RAD. I know it's confusing. Uh, you're still getting public housing money until the end of the fiscal year. So we get another three months, which would make us up to 12,000 because we're just making life easy. Nice, easy thousand dollars a month. Um, but that last 3,000 you get for those last three months goes to an expense line, which blows everyone's mind too, in the public housing, 973 is housing assistance payments. You show housing assistance payments going out, and in this entity, they created a blended component unit. The blended component unit receives that money, and everyone goes, well, you're now you're doubling up the money. Now we have, you know, if, if you stop before the elimination column, we got $15,000 of income, when we really only received $12,000 worth of income. Well, we do eliminations, and that's what HUD's asked us to do, is we do eliminations and uh, eliminate out that uh, separate um, blended component unit money because it's really public housing funds and we eliminate out those housing assistance payments because those are just paying ourselves and you transfer 100% of the public housing money that comes in so you don't try to figure out how much the expenses were you just transfer whatever public housing subsidy you receive that month you transfer it straight over to the blended component unit who then records the monthly activities whatever the salaries are whatever the um, expenses are are recorded in that blended component unit column so you can see this starts getting confusing now we have two columns we're recording stuff during a year, half and half. So I think this one's kind of the same thing, but now we're just doing it with a discreetly presented component unit. The only thing to show on here is um, this is where it gets kind of confusing because discreetly presented component units, we don't eliminate. Um, and that's the only thing I'm gonna really say on here. It's the exact same decision scenario. Everything's exactly the same, um, except for there is no elimination. So we do end up showing $15,000 worth of income and three thousand dollars worth of expenses because you cannot eliminate between discreetly presented and primary governments which is your public housing entity so that's the only thing i was showing here that's mostly for any auditor sitting in the room um, you don't eliminate those items so here's just kind of a different scenario so you can kind of look at it so you can uh the accounting people in the room can kind of see what it's going to look like if you're looking at the you know and this doesn't show the split the mid-year, this is just kind of showing what it ends up looking like when you get done, is <clears throat> you have the public housing has everything. There's nothing really in your blended component and the business activities this year. There's nothing happening. Um, I just showed it there. You probably wouldn't even be on your FDS in 2020. But let's say you convert and uh, we start out 2021, the whole balance sheet gets moved over to the business activities column. 
and we may still be receiving money under public housing because we did it before, let's say we did it March 31st. Um, you wouldn't show any of the balance sheet there because at the end of December or whatever year end we are, our balance sheet's completely over in business activities. Uh, we still do have to show that revenue coming in under public housing, finishing out the contract. And again, just like the other examples, we show the 350 uh, being transferred out over to business activities. Um, and that negative 350 was just kind of showing that we would uh, be uh, spending, or that's supposed to be just your general expenses where you'd be spending that money at. So you can see how that works out, they eliminate out. I think I do another slide and let's go to the next one. It's kind of just showing you each time what it would look like. Uh, again, doesn't matter which column we're picking. Uh, this is the one Doug was just talking about. We did a multifamily housing uh, where we kept it inside the housing authority, but we're doing multifamily housing. Same scenario, I do put up there on the top that you have to do um, a HUD react that encompasses both those columns. And then you would have a HUD multifamily housing, which is just the multifamily housing activity reporting to the HUD uh, react system. So that one, Whoever is your lucky accountant to auditor would have to file two REACT submissions, and that will be ongoing for the rest of your uh, career uh, because those two systems don't talk to each other. And so you have to show um, both systems what's going on. HUD multifamily housing is expecting a, finan a financial reporting on just the multifamily housing side, and then HUD REACT is expecting obviously the full blown picture of what's going on inside the housing authority. So it adds yeah. a layer. And Chad, on, on those light techs, uh... So you can file an owner certified and an audited, or if you have, what is it, if you do it within- Yeah, so let's go, go back one hand real quick, just to that one before. Um, on this one, where this is the deal. So this is where I like when Doug brings up these good questions, because this is one of those things, this is where it really helps to have somebody who understands this, uh, if you're going down the rad pathway. If you do it this way, where we're doing multifamily housing and the housing authority retains the assets inside its EIN number, we're not doing a separate component unit. We're gonna keep it inside the housing authority. You can get a waiver and all you have to file with multifamily housing is the unaudited submission. And you can ask for a waiver on the audit of multifamily housing. Uh, it's a special little tiny rule. A lot of times we've got to fight with reviewers, but we win every time because it's in their HUD guidelines. Um, if you put this same situation and you put it multifamily housing, you do PBRA and you put it out in a separate component unit, there is no exemption. Uh, you have to have, and which means you probably need a separate audit report. Because if you've done a multifamily housing submission, like Doug has done himself, he's thinking in his mind, I've got to have notes, I've got to have opinions, I've got to have everything on this separate multifamily housing. So it doesn't add a layer of cost when you do it this way. Um, so that's one of the advantages of keeping it inside the housing authority is that you can get away from having a whole separate audit report done on just the multifamily housing. Make sense, Doug? Think I got that explained well? No, yeah, I, I was just going to say that... Uh... Yeah, you actually went into some other questions that, that I didn't think of at the time, but I was just going to say that if you do uh, the audited version, when you're doing the tax credit, the multifamily housing submissions, if you do the audited version fast enough, you yeah. don't have to do the owner certified. So it's not like when you're doing your regular housing authority FDS input where you have to do the unaudited and the audited. If you yeah. can get that tax credit, if you can get that, uh, that multifamily housing audited fast enough, you just have to do one of the one of the submissions. You don't have to put it in once and then have to put it in again. So That's a very good point. How fast is fast, Doug? I think it's what is it? Two, 90. three months? 90 days. 90 days. Yeah. Yeah. Three yeah. Months. So as long as you finish your audit on those multifamily housing, like Doug's talking about, as long as you finish it in 90 days, you don't have to do two submissions like everyone's familiar with. Uh, housing authorities will always do two submissions. There's no there's no way to do it any other way. You have to do one unaudited and audited. Um, in multifamily housing, there's a little rule that says if you can finish the audit within 90 days of fiscal year end, you can do one submission, audited, done. And so yeah, and that makes it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. those submissions aren't, aren't fun. They actually have a statement of cash flows. So just think of having to do that for your housing authority to have all those numbers line up for a statement of cash flows. The multifamily housing submission makes you do that. So they're- Yeah, that they're should not, be more. This should be my other poll, right, Doug? How many of you do your own statement of cash flows and who wants to do it on a multifamily housing by itself? I mean, most of our clients don't do those statement of cash flows and you have to do it on a preset HUD formatted statement of cash flows too, not just you make it up how you want it. Yeah, we're at, uh, we're at um, for me, 735. So that's what, 935 for you? Yeah, so I got about 15 more minutes. So I'll pick it up a little bit here <clears throat> to make sure we get through all these items. Um, again, all I want to point out here, if you do the... Uh, 
this uh, under React, like we were just talking about, if you do it under a separate component unit, you're adding, see how the layers are keep getting built it on there. You still have to do that multifamily housing submission. You're going to have a new IEIN number, which means you probably have a separate tax return. So I'm just showing how you're building complexity into these RAD deals. And so that's probably why you want an accountant auditor in your development stage to make sure you understand what you're signing for, what you're getting yourself into. The complexity. <clears throat> I think the last one, I think I did one. So here's my slide that drives most developers crazy. Um, I tell you, do not close your deal one to two months before your fiscal year end. That's for your own sanity. Um, accountants in the room, executive directors in the room. If you wanna keep your accountant, please don't close their deal in the last month or two of your fiscal year end. You will drive them crazy. Uh, you will tick off your auditor. Um, you will slow everything down. Uh, I can go into great detail. We don't have a lot of time about it, but just take my advice. We've done these enough times. If you can delay that thing one month or speed it up, get it done three months before year end. You saw my example. I don't mind you doing it three months before year end. That gives you plenty of time to get your balance sheet situated out and your adjusting journal entries done. If you do it one to two months before the year end, you're throwing the closing of that deal into them preparing for year end audit and unaudited submission and everything else. I can just pile the mountain of stuff you're putting on them. It just adds a lot of headaches. Um, but sometimes the money is just there and that's the only time you can do it. Light tech deals, a lot of times you don't have a choice. And I just go, hey, if you're going to get the money out of it and this is the only time you can do it, just be prepared for angry auditors and angry accountants. Uh, but we'll get over it and we'll get through it. It's only one time. But if you can do anything to help that, uh, I encourage you to do that. I also say check with your fee account and your auditor. You don't have to go back. I know what they are. Um, check with your fee account and your auditor. Make sure that they have experience in this area right? If you're public housing only and you're moving to multifamily housing, there is a lot of auditors and a lot of fee accountants who've never touched multifamily housing. Coach is a whole nother filing system. Uh, they may have never seen it. They may not even know how to do it. Make sure they know what they're, they're in for. I've had a couple auditors just say, when you go rad, I'm not doing your audit anymore. I don't do multifamily housing. Sorry. Um, and then this is just a, you know, tidying up. If you can get all your fiscal year ends the same, if you have component units, uh, I can tell you there's probably a couple people in this room, we've helped them move their fiscal years all to the same. It saves lots of accounting headaches. Um, if you go lie tech, uh, remember, um, if you're in a lie tech deal, remember you hold the assets, you hold the credits. That's what everyone wants. They'll try to sell you on their experience and why they need the developer fee and you should only get next to nothing. Yeah, but you have the assets and you have the credits. Just remember that. So you should be getting some of the developer fee but not all of it. Don't go into a deal thinking you're going to get 80% of the developer fee. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, first time around, maybe you're getting 20, 30%, you know, and as you go further down the deals, maybe you're getting 50, 60% of the developer fee because you're doing a lot of the work. Um, but the developer and consultants stand to make money on this deal um, if you do it. So just remember, you kind of have the strings. Make sure you use those. I'm seeing so many people not leverage what they have. You have the assets, you have the credits. They don't have any of that. They can have all the expertise they want, but they don't have the golden ticket and you have it. So make sure you use that. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, yeah. So we got a question. So from, from your experience, how the housing authorities, how much leeway do they have on the closing dates on, on their RAD deals? They hold the assets, they hold the credits, they have the RAD deal. They can make it or break it. Um, again, sometimes the deal is where it's a hard thing. They can't change it, right? Um, and so don't get me wrong where I'm saying you cannot close one to two months before year end. I'm saying where you have wiggle room, make sure you do it. Ask, what's the problem with this closing July 2nd or June 30 year end? You know, what's the problem with us pushing it up? Can't we close April 30th? Um, that way, at least you ask the question. Um, if it becomes one of those things, there's just no way around it. If you don't close on May 25th, you're just, the deal's going to go away. Okay, close May 25th. Um, there's no problem with that. I just have so many people who don't ask. They just, they told me it was May 25th. Did you ask about changing it? No. Oh, well, just ask, you know, that's the thing. So you have wiggle room, you have some power, um, exert what you can. Uh, don't blow a deal up because Chad said not to do it the last two months of the year. All right. Thank you, Chad. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one. And this one's just to scare you. <laughs> this is what a live tech deal looks like. And if I sat here, I could probably tell you in 30 minutes all the different things that are going on in there. But the center is the live tech deal and all around it, all those different colored entities are different people doing different things. 
of the lie tech deal. That's how many people you have to deal with when you put together a lie tech deal. So you definitely want a partner um, who is not one of those people helping you. Don't rely on the developer. They're one of those people. They're stand to make money. You want a consultant. Um, you want a, your accountant, your auditor involved to make sure that you're getting your interests looked after. These guys all do this for a living on a regular basis. They know where to cut corners. They know where to do things that will make it best for them. You've never done one before. You need some help. Uh, it doesn't have to be us. It can be a developer. It can be a consultant. Uh, but find someone you trust that's going to have the housing authority's um, thoughts and process, not their pocket in process. So just to scare you, that's how complex a <laughs> tax credit deal can be. All right, so the pros of doing HCV. Um, if you already do HCV, uh, the PBV system, piece of cake, you know it. No training your staff. There's very limited differences between the project-based vouchers and the HCV system. So limited curve uh, on learning, possible staff reduction, because uh, you're not gonna need all the public housing people that you had, um, but you're probably gonna have to add some HCV people um, to oversee it. So there could be a possibility of reduction of staff. I know people don't like to hear that, but you do need to run this thing lean and um, uh, keep it as inexpensive as possible. Uh, you have COCC fees you can be collecting. Um, the HCV system will get an influx of those because, I mean, I mean an influx of costs because they're gonna have to pay uh, additional vouchers, they're going to pay additional amounts over to the COCC. So those are some of the pros of project-based vouchers. Some of the cons, you know, your rent capped at reasonable rents. Um, the big one, I think, admin fee uh, um, and proration, right? Um, when we talk about PBRA, we're going to talk about how they're always going up. Admin fees sometimes go down. Uh, I'm not sure where we're at right now because I don't pay attention to that. That's usually the accountants who do that, but I think we're at proration somewhere in the mid 90s. Um, I've seen it as low as the high 80s. Um, so if their proration on your fees are killing you on that part, putting more items into this voucher system is just going to make that hurt even more. Uh, and then you got the one year mobility. You know, after one year of being in the um, PBV system, they can get on the waiting list to get a mobile mobility HCV voucher. Now, I want to make sure this is clear to everybody because I was a little confused on this before. Your PBV voucher doesn't go anywhere. The tenant applies to go on the HCV system and get a choice voucher that they can move along with to get mobility. That PBV voucher stays there in that unit. Another family will move in and take over that voucher, um, but they do have the ability to jump onto the HCV system, but they have to go through the normal waiting process and, and, and get on there and they can be mobile. So you can lose um, tenants and have turnover. So that's one of the disadvantages of PBV. Um, the revenues for PBV, you get HAP um, for the HCV program uh, and the tenant fees, is that enough to cover the expenses? So you got to look when you're doing a PBV and you're just going to get HAP and whatever the tenant's going to pay you, is that going to be enough to cover the expenses? And, and what are the expenses going to be? Probably whatever the AMP's cost was. You know, that's a pretty good spot to start is with the, if that AMP cost $300,000 to run, it's probably going to cost $300,000 to run under PBV. So is the HAP and the tenant files, tenant fees going to cover that $300,000? Um, and don't forget HCV, you want to budget in there so they can pay the COCC if you have it. Um, and is that enough to cover the additional staff members? So this is where you start leaning on your auditors and your accountants to run some scenarios for you. Uh, we have spreadsheets. We do it all the time for clients. Is like we try to, that's when I say pencil it out. Pencil it out. Is it going to work? Uh, you don't want to put yourself in a worse situation than you're already in. This should be a step up for you. So my conclusion on these ones real quick is just, you know, if you don't have an HCV system, you should not even consider project-based vouchers. If you want to, we can have a long discussion, you know, just call me up and we can talk about it. There is ways you can do it if you don't have an HCV system, but I just tell you, you really should not consider it. Um, limits the fees in the COCC, um, but there's the limited curve, you know, you're, you don't have to learn a new system. There's no multifamily housing system we've been talking about. You can ignore that. You don't have to learn about that. No separate filing, you know, so that is a big advantage over here. Um, basically, you're just moving public housing and capital fund into an HCV system only. And I have a couple of really large housing authorities that have gone to just all they have is HCV now. We call them HCV only, uh, makes it easy. I can tell you which gonna be multifamily, which your uh, major program's gonna be for the audit because all you have is HCV. <laughs> no surprise, every year we're testing that one. Um, and the other one, big disadvantage, portability and the proration. 
um, that's a disadvantage too. You have to look at those. So let's jump into PBRA. Um, some of the big pros of PBRA, surplus cash, you get done. You have excess cash. We were just talking about that. That was one of the questions someone was asking. That money is yours to do what you want with. It's no longer restricted. It's not like HCV with restricted net position or it's stuck inside of public housing reserves and you can only use it on public housing. No, that surplus cash, you can do what you like with that inside the housing authority. As long as it fits low-income housing, that's your restriction, which is pretty loose. That's all you do. Uh, like I say, you can't go on a trip to Tahiti, but you can buy another project down the street. You can buy a house, refurbish it, and sell it to you know an FSS escrow tenant. Um, sources for capital and, and uh, improvements. Most of these project-based rental assistants are going to have you setting aside for replacement reserves. Um, so you're kind of doing your own capital fund program built in to your system. Now, it's on a funding stream, but it's the system making you put aside money so that when it comes time to repair and replace things, you have money for it. And probably one of the biggest pros that we always talk about on PBRA is there's no proration. Um, I've never seen them under 100%. They keep going up. That 100 keeps going. Why you have to remember that is because there's a lot of for-profit entities in the PBRA system and they have money and they fight in Congress to make sure those do not happen. There is no proration on these. Cons, um, your rent, you're, you're still rent capped at fair market uh, rents. Um, you have this learning curve. You're gonna have to learn the new HUD React system for the accountants. Your people doing eligibility are gonna have to learn tracks. You're out of um, picks and you're into tracks. So it's a new system to learn. Again, just a headache to get over that hump, but you, yeah, you have to learn that headache and get over that. Um, it's the only option for public housing. I say that so many times because I just don't think you should do it if you don't, if you are public housing only, this is probably your only choice. You should not even be looking at the uh, PBV. And they do have the two-year mobility, um, but that's if um, you can sometimes get exempted from mobility under PBRA. If you're a public housing only entity and there's no way for them to get a mobility voucher, um, a lot of times when you're filling your paperwork out, again, this is where it helps to have someone that knows what they're doing, you can get exempted from mobility. So that becomes not even an issue for you anymore on PBRA because you don't have any vouchers to hand out. There's no way for them to sign up for it. Um, the revenues, again, you're going to get your HAP money, um, same, same system. So you're going to have to look at those, uh, surplus cash can be able to support the COCC or anywhere else. Obviously your excess cash can go wherever you would like. Um, but the question is, will there be any surplus cash? So you need to run some, uh, estimates running how much revenue you're going to collect and then how much were your expenses in the past? And are you going to be able to come out ahead or behind? So for PBRA, you're looking at, you know, it's pretty much the only choice for my small housing authorities that are public housing only. Um, but the good news is there's no proration. Um, you're not limited to just charging an admin fee. Surplus cash is surplus cash. It's not limited to an admin fee to the COCC. You can transfer your surplus cash over to the COCC. But again, you have to learn a whole new system, you know. Uh, so that is a tough one. So you have to weigh those out too. Chad, did you want to do a poll really quick? Yeah, let's do a poll. I forgot. I've been talking all the time and you, I forgot to do polls. So let's do a poll real quick. Do no, not it? yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay, I clicked launch. Seems to be, oh, here we go. Let me do it one more time. It failed. We might have to skip the poll. Doesn't I had really good polls too. I can lie now since you can't see them. You had really They're good awesome. polls. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go to the next slide. See if I can finish this up so we can get some questions in. Okay. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, public housing funding is decreasing. Public housing is decreasing because people are leaving. They're going to RAD. So again, think about, you don't want to be the last guy on the bus. That's probably my biggest point is look at this stuff. Um, RAG gives you the opportunity to redevelop um, and you don't have to do it. Um, you can do it with either debt or reserves. I mean, some people are sitting on huge reserves. Um, you can take those reserves and dump them into the building. Um, and if you do it in your own in, and you just put another column in your housing, you're not giving the reserves to anybody. You're just freeing those reserves up to do what you want with those. Um, RAD gives you more opportunities. Um, public housing, you couldn't take your reserves and go buy a building down the street You know, if something becomes available. Under RAD, you could, if you have those reserves sitting there and an opportunity comes up and you wanna buy the piece of land next to you, you can buy that piece of land next to you, build more housing uh, right next to you. Uh, so 
Rad's not all bad when it first came out, kind of like when COCC first came out, I was anti COCC. I was anti rad when it first came out, but as the numbers pencil out, you go, well, these aren't so bad. Let's take advantage of what they're giving us uh, and make sure it works good. Uh, but just make sure you're, you know, got people in your corner helping you. Uh, you don't get sold the wrong bill of goods and then run the numbers. That's where, that's where the accountants and the auditors come in play, you know, run those numbers. We have them. It's pretty simple for us to run that information for you and tell you what it's going to do to your financial statements and, when we do it, so we say independent, we don't ever make, don't ask us, should I do it or not do it? What we'll tell you is, here's the numbers. You figure out if you should do it or not do it. I'm not going to tell you, go ahead and do it, not do it. I will tell you, hey, based on these numbers, this is the revenue you have. Based on the expenses you've had in the past, this is what you're looking at for net income. Here's what you can charge for COCCs. Back to you, your decision. You know, So you have to make that decision. As independent auditors, we can't make and give you advice on whether to pick or not pick. Uh, but we can give you numbers and let you look at those numbers and say, this is what it looks like uh, we predict. So you can make an informed decision. I think that's the end of them, right? Yeah. So do we have any other questions that anyone wants? Um, any fears that you have? Anything that wasn't answered in those areas? We have about 10 minutes, maybe, no. Hannah? No, not yet. Um, yeah, just the accounting side looks like one of the, the only questions. I mean, and I... I don't know if you mentioned this, but uh, you probably want to talk about a little bit about the accounting for uh, for PBV. I, I, like I said, I haven't done a lot of PBRAs, but I know for PBV, when the housing authority gets those those that voucher money, they're going to show that as you know 706 money coming into the the, the Section 8 program, and then right. they're going to show they're going to show a HAP expense going out. Now, depending on where you put your your RAD, if it's if it's blended or inside the housing authority, that 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 component is going to show it as rent revenue, right? But then yep. you're going to have to eliminate, so you're going to have to because it's intercompany now. So you have intercompany HAP uh, coming out of HCV, and you have intercompany rent coming into your RAD component or wherever you put it inside the housing authority. If right. it's discrete, you're not going to eliminate, like Chad said, you don't eliminate discrete. But so so you'll actually be eliminating those. And when you look at when you look at the the housing authority in total, if you convert you know a whole bunch over, you're gonna say, hey, this isn't how much HAP that we we paid. We paid a lot more HAP. Well, that's intercompany, you know. So so that's not gonna show up on your on your basic financial statements. Yep. And then that's I'll, where, I'll, that adds ahead. that complexity we were talking about. I mean, when you yeah. start doing this stuff, you know, especially. PBV, like Doug's talking about, you will have to put it in a separate legal entity if you're going to manage that contract, the HCV contract, which just adds a layer of, of work that, you know, your accountant has to get up to speed on, your auditor has to be up to speed on. And then, you know, the conversion process, you know, I prefer they convert all the units, <laughs> not just part, because that's a fun calculation when you have to figure out, oh, they only converted 60% of their units. Uh, that's, that's that's a fun calculation to do. Right, because they didn't put the fixed asset on. You didn't put, out of 300 units, you didn't put 300 buildings on your fixed asset list. You put probably building one and building two. And you're going to do 150 units. And so from the accounting side, it becomes the, okay, how do we take those fixed assets and break them down? Because they're not down to that threshold of, I can pull 200 units out or I can pull 120 units out. We have to start doing estimates and it's not just the fixed assets it's the equipment it's the accumulated depreciation again like doug's saying that's where you're going to need someone to help you it's a lot more complicated when you do part of an amp and here in tennessee a lot of people put everything into one amp you know out where doug's at in california uh, most people put them in multiple amps so sometimes it's easier you just take your one amp and you go um, <clears throat> at a time but here in tennessee because the local office advised them just to make it one big amp and um so now you have, you know, three projects inside your AMP and taking them apart sometimes is pretty complex. So you'll definitely need help there. <clears throat> Any other questions? Oh, there you go. There's our polling question. What's our size? You know, um, a lot of you I know, so I can kind of uh, guess what that's going to come out at, but let's see where we kind of uh, have for size. This is just your public housing too. I'm not talking about, um, and if you've gone rad already, let's just put in what you had before you went rad. Um, so if you're completely ratted out and you say, I have none, no. What did you have before you went rad? And I 
I'm just gonna give it about 30 more seconds. Okay. Okay, looks like I'm about to close it. So the last few people can get their answers in. Okay, let's see. 2599, that's what I was gonna guess where most people are gonna fall. <clears throat> that's that medium-sized housing authority. Um, a lot of you are gonna have public housing only. You're probably not gonna have an HCV system, but you might. Um, and those ones that are 150 to 250 probably don't have it. <clears throat> I know Doug does one that has what, 48 public housing units and 35 vouchers, maybe. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, they don't have to have a single audit. They're so small. But they have both programs. It's kind of, that's a kind of a unusual uh, item there. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, we can maybe break a few minutes early. If they yeah, want, let's then, uh, let's launch the next poll because um, we have one more, and yeah. you know, this is your one chance to ask uh, two CPAs whatever you want to ask about. Rent. <laughs> yeah, Everything whatever's you confusing ask, you. Um, we won't say who free. asked either. You can you can ask anonymously. We won't say who it was. Yeah, you can be anonymous. So uh, yeah, feel free to you know really just ask whatever you want to ask. Um, this is your this is your chance. I'm gonna put the next poll up. Ignore that one. <laughs> I was like, I know the answer. Who's not liking the polls today? Mm -mm. Nope, we'll just have to pass on that one. Okay. Zoom's just not a fan of it. And, um, you know, every rad deal is different. So, you know, I can't give you a boilerplate what it's going to look like. So each person is going to have to do their own. You're going to have to, you know, it's based on your funding streams and where you're at. So, but. <clears throat> Encourage those people. I think there was about eight of them that had not started. I would encourage you to start. At least know the answer. Like, yep, we tried it. Don't say I tried it three years ago. I would definitely say if you haven't tried in the last year or two, uh, looking at the numbers, you probably want to go look again. And with that, okay. we could probably break early if you're. Okay, we can break early. We'll just come back at uh, five after, and Doug can excite you with cares money. Spend, spend, spend. We actually got a question, Chad. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Are you seeing the CNA contractors taking advantage of the housing authorities by trying to get more work out of them? I'm not sure if CNA is a particular contractor, but uh, yes, contractors will definitely try to take advantage of you. Uh, developers will definitely try to take advantage of you. I'm not saying all developers and all contractors are bad. I'm just saying they're going to focus on their pocketbook first and getting the housing authority stuff done. Um, yeah, the PBRCs and the environmental guys, um, you have to have environmental reports. So, I mean, there's no getting around that. Um, but uh, I do a little skit about uh, procurement uh, and not overkilling procurement. But on this area, you probably want to procure this pretty well. You want to bid check that and make sure you're getting, you know, a good few quotes before you pick who's working. And then again, don't always try to save money. You want to do who's ever going to get it done correctly the first time you know uh, the guy who comes in twenty thousand dollars less but's never done one before is probably not my first choice um check with other and then the other one check with other housing authorities have done this who they use and how were they happy with them same way you do with auditors i mean y'all i know y'all talk about us um no problem with that and i have a pretty good reputation so i encourage you to talk about us but you should talk about these guys too the contractors the environmental guys any of those uh who'd you use uh how did it go um were you happy? Were they responsive? What was the problems with them? Um, I'll probably before you even bid it, you know, uh, that way, you know, what you're looking at, you're, you're, you know, they're going to be open and frank with you with your other housing authority, especially TAR members. We're a pretty close knit group. Um, call them up, ask them how it went. But yeah, watch out. Can't say that enough. All right. Well, if they have any questions, we come back, we can jump Does in those at the beginning. Question? Oh, okay. 
<laughs> See, they, they were just waiting for me to it get, get up and go. It just takes a minute to type out the questions, though. I understand. Yeah, that's fine. You guys can keep asking them, too. I'll sit through the break. I don't care, because uh, when Doug's talking, I can, I, can, I can relax after that. Does your firm provide RAG conversion assistance, if not the auditor for the PHA? Even if we are the auditor, um, we can uh, uh, help with some of that stuff. Now, if you're talking about um, conversion, as far as like we were talking about tearing the buildings apart and um, how to do that journal entry, well, we would be the one that would audit that transaction. So we wouldn't want to do that. So if you're talking about, hey, I've got one amp uh, and I need to split it up and I need that, no, we would tell you, uh, we can refer you to a couple fee accounts if we're your auditor. If we're not your auditor, sure. Um, I do that for a couple. Uh, we also do that for the pencil it out kind of things. Uh, you don't usually deal with me or Doug. We usually get uh, Pete Wesh, the other partner. He's a tax guy. Um, he usually helps with those areas. Um, You'll still see our face and work with it, but he likes to pencil those numbers out. He's got his spreadsheets and he can pencil those out pretty quick for us and, and go through them. But yeah, if we're your auditor, we can help you with the conversion process. Um, if it's just a straightforward 100%. Um, I know I'm helping a couple of my clients right now as they go through that. Um, you may see a little extra dollar bills on your uh, invoice. I mean, we don't do that for free, but we do help you because um, someone has to help you get those items through. And as long as it's not something that is making decisions we can we can help we just got to protect our independence if we're your auditor um okay another question um would you help us review the pro forma provided from the development partner yep that's one of the ones that's where we feel the most comfortable somebody else is doing the pro forma um, and we're just helping them look at it with you to try to point out anything we see um, hey, I don't think they considered this. I don't think they considered that. They're selling you something that looks too rosy. That's not how pretty it's going to look. Or, you know, hey, what, what's this cost? Why are they putting that in there? That doesn't seem like that's a reasonable cost. That's making it look worse than it's really going to be. So yeah, we have no problem uh, doing that part. That's probably one of the best ones because we're not doing the calculations. Um, but we put safeguards in. That's why we like to use Pete. He's not the auditor. Um, and that way we're putting a little safeguards between us where we're not auditing our own information. But yeah, those things, I definitely encourage you to ask us um, to help with those areas. We'd rather help you now than look at it later when we're doing the audit going, ooh, that wasn't very good right there. Too late then, I can't really help you. Developer, developer's not gonna give you money back. <laughs> okay, we are right on schedule to start whenever you're ready, Doug. Okay. All right. Well, um, yeah, answers to your questions about PHA CARES funds. So uh, there's a lot of PHA CARES fund webinars and seminars out there. And probably if this is the first one that you're attending, that's probably not a good uh, thing. Uh, you should have uh, been inside on this and, and watching webinars and at, at least be somewhat familiar uh, with what's going out there with the, you know, all the supplemental, the ACV supplemental, the uh, public housing supplemental. So this, this shouldn't be the first trip to your rodeo. So uh, in this presentation, what I try to do is, you know, any current updates, any current updates that are going on with, uh, you know, the timelines, your period of availability, filing deadlines, uh, issues that we're seeing with REACTS. So a big one I've seen... <laughs> I know a lot of people are getting their reacts rejected right now. Uh, you're unaudited, so I don't know if your auditor is doing yours or if you have a fee accountant doing them, but we're getting a lot of rejections. And a lot of the rejections are that uh, we're not following the guidance uh, in the right in the PIC notices for your, your HCV and your public housing and the, and the COCC, all these care funds. So if you're having trouble trying to get your, uh, your unaudited, uh, to, to pass REACT review, this will probably be helpful for you. Uh, if you're getting ready to submit your audited, this will probably be helpful for you. Um, if your auditor or accountant's doing it, hopefully they're watching. Um, it, and, it, and just in general, for you to review the work, if your fee accountant's doing the work for you or if the auditor's helping you, this should help your general understanding. So you can go take these slides, take some of the information that I provide. And go check, go check what the what the auditor sub, uh, is submitting for you. What's your fee account submitting, and make sure that that we're we're hitting these check marks um, and using some of this guidance. And and I'll tell you where to go to for the pick notices and all of that. So, 
that, that that's mainly what this is. Is this is not for for people that don't understand what the CARES Fund is. Um, so a little bit about myself. Licensed in 2014, I have my California and Tennessee CPA license. I've been with Smith Marion since 2012. I got made partner 2018, 2019, somewhere around there. I do 20 plus housing authorities, nonprofits that are inside the housing authorities, uh, the discreetly presented component units, multifamily housing, LIHTC. Uh, I do a lot of those. Uh, graduated from Cal State San Bernardino. So out here in California, where I currently work, work out of the Redlands office, and I'm a member of the Tennessee and California uh, Society of CPAs. Uh, there's my contact information right there. I have, I have CPA license, I have my master's in accounting, I'm a principal or a partner here at the firm. And then uh, off to the right, you'll see my dog, that's Cooper. And uh, he doesn't work in accounting field, but he's a certified cookie tester, so. All right, so yeah, areas to cover. So allowable costs, obviously, I'm gonna go over that one. There's so many questions about allowable costs. I get emails, uh, especially when it first came out, is this allowable, is that allowable? And with the guidance, they weren't very clear with what was allowable, but you know, we've talked to HUD, we've talked to our contacts, we've talked to a lot of other auditors and people in the industry. So it's pretty nailed down now. So I'll go over that. Uh, some of the relevant pick notices, so the important ones, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little list of the ones that you're going to want to keep an eye on. Um, REACT reporting. So that's probably where I'm going to spend most of my time is the REACT reporting. Because like I said, I know a lot of people are getting uh, everything rejected right now uh, with, their, with their REACT analysts. So we'll go through that. We'll talk about the CFA, so your schedule of uh, federal awards, the presentation of the, the supplemental funds in there. Also, if you're working on clearinghouse submissions, so your, your SFSAC, uh, I'll show you how, how that should be presented uh, when you're inputting those awards. And then we'll talk about quarterly reporting. Uh, so that was one of the big things that they, they said was gonna happen is that they're gonna uh, require these quarterly reports for the, the, the supplemental funding if you received over 150. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about the developments and, and what we're hearing uh, in the, down the grapevine on that one. So. Start off, what costs are allowable? This was a big topic. A lot of people were very confused when it first came out. So HUD stance is those supplemental funds, anything that the original program you could use that money on, you can use that money on with the COVID funds. So salaries, any general expenses, if you're buying any equipment, all that stuff is covered. Anything that you could have spent with the regular funds for that program, you can spend that, those monies using the, the COVID supplemental funds. Um, so if you, if you got, if you have an HCV program and uh, you're getting HAP and then you got a supplemental HAP, well, guess what? You can use that on HAP. <laughs> That's, you can't use it on anything else, but the admin portion, obviously you can use that on other operating costs, salaries. So really what they did uh, when, when, they, when they started explaining what costs are eligible is they said, they're adding on to. So, so don't think of like the, the restrictions against these funds as far as, you know, th these are restricted co for only COVID. They, they, they're just adding, what, what they really did is they added new, they, they, they added these new new allowable costs, right? For hazard pay, overtime, additional paid time off, childcare, PPP equipment. Um, so obviously, if you're incurring overtime, it should be due to the COVID-19 pandemic. If there's childcare costs, it should be due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You shouldn't just be offering childcare costs, uh, you know, as a new thing. It should be because they're not in school, or you know, you, you have to be able to prove that that this stuff is due to, to COVID-19 pandemic. So they they really just added on to the things that you're allowed to use these funds for. They're they're allowing overtime. Uh, they're allowing for you to pay your inspectors hazard pay um, for going in and inspecting these units and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the things that's strictly prohibited is paying off debt. You, they don't want you using it to pay off housing authority debt. They don't want you to use it to pay back HUD. So if you owe HUD money, they, they don't want you to take this supplemental and pay them back. Um, and they, they're not allowing you to keep this in your reserves. 
So um, I'll talk a little bit later about the extension, but we, we have until 12-31-2021 uh, to spend the funds now. So they, they did an extension for those funds. So, but anything you don't spend, they're gonna want back. So pretty, pretty simple. Uh, a lot, a lot of my, a lot of my clients call me up. Can I spend it on this? Can I spend it on that? And would you spend it normally uh, it, on that uh, particular program or that project? Is it, would it be allowable under just normal circumstances? Yeah, you're fine. You use that, use those funds, right? Now, when, when it's not normal stuff, that's when we start thinking, okay, is this because of the COVID-19 pandemic or not? Um, one of the other things you got to be careful with is that if you're gonna, if if the executive director or one of your, you know, um, one of the the higher paid employees, maybe is getting overtime or additional pay or hazard pay or stuff like that, you still have the income the the, you still have the income limits for executives. So I, I forget what the number is right now. It was like 250 or something like that. It's a level four executive uh, on the on the government schedule. So you still have to make sure you you know, those income limits are being adhered to for the particular programs. Ooh. Okay, so pick notices, pick notices. Most important one that, that for me, I'm an accountant, I'm an auditor. I use this one for doing the REAC. Uh, the, this one, if, if you go into HUD, uh, website and you go get you pick notice 2020-24 this gives you all the accounting treatment for all of the supplemental funds it gives examples of all the transactions that you can encounter it gives you, it tells you what fds lines to code it to um, very very important uh, it it explains the the period uh, period of availability the that's going from 1231 uh, 2021 so that one's great. That I, I, I live and die by that one. Whenever I see that someone got rejected on their REAC, I, I just take a look and say, okay, well, did do we follow this pick notice? Because that's what they're gonna tell you, hey, that's the pick notice that, that all this stuff can be found in. So very, very important uh, pick notice right there. And then the following one, pick notice 2020-33. So in case you're unaware, if you're using these extensions and, and you're, you're, you're abiding by some of these changes that are coming with CARES, you want to make sure that your board's approving um, that, that you guys aren't filing on time, that you guys are using this uh, particular waiver that HUD's offering, right? So in that particular pick notice, you can go through all the waivers and check and see which ones are you using and making sure that, that that's not something you just decided on your own. That's something that's been board approved, right? Because the board is the governance and we wanna make sure that they're overseeing the housing authority correctly. So um, pretty important to make sure that you know which, which waivers that, that you guys are, are using. Um, some of the other ones, is just the general, so in tw uh, all the pick notices for CARES are pretty much in 2020. So if you go to all the 2020 pick notices, that's where you'll see the very first uh, CARES uh, for ACV admin, cares for ACV HAP, uh, eligibility, and, and they update and they supersede each other as far as explaining more and more of what the eligible costs are and, and the different reporting requirements and, and period of availability. So the pick notice 2020-24, that's pretty much the last one that that's gave us a period of availability. So that's kind of the one that I like to stick to a lot, but uh, those other pick notices, they'll have CARES Act in them. Just go through, read them. Uh, make sure you're familiar with those pick notices. Very important, especially you don't want HUD to come in and audit your CARES funds and you tell me, hey, I didn't even read that pick notice. I didn't know that. That's not a, they're not going to be happy with that answer. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start getting to some of the accounting and the fun stuff for me. So if you're, if you're executive director or you're just an operation person and you don't, you, you're not big on the accounting side, this is going to be pretty boring and dry. For me as an auditor and probably for Chad, we like this stuff. We like to make sure that we're you know, crossing our T's and dotting our I's. Um, so for me particularly, and I don't know how Chad, how Chad feels about this, but I recommend that you keep track of your CARES funds you, using separate funds. Now, I, most of my clients, a lot of my clients, what they do is they just create new account numbers. 
and they leave it in the fund. So say they'll have an HCV fund and then what they do to, to identify between a, a, a regular HAP revenue and a COVID HAP revenue is that they just put a, a different you know, uh, account number at the end of it and say that this is CARES HAP revenue, right? You, you can run into all kinds of issues. I, I, I just say it, it's easier to just create a new fund. And so you can see on this slide, the different programs that's, that got created well, sub programs, they're, they're, they're not true separate programs, um, but these sub uh, programs here, you got the 14 point PHC, which is your public housing CARES Act funding. You have all of these. And I would recommend that you create a separate fund and keep track of that fund separate. It should be just like any other fund where it self balances. You're gonna have a way better time if you keep track of this in a fund because it's self balancing right? Your assets are going to equal your liabilities plus your equity, right? And you're going to have your revenues and expenses all inside that one fund column. Uh, it, when you start using just, just trying to use accounts, that's, it that gets really tricky because then you have to figure, okay, well, these accounts belong in this fund and then these accounts belong over here and you got to try to balance it. It, it, it makes a headache. Um, one of the benefits to using this, just creating a separate fund is you can use your existing chart of accounts already all right, you, you, you should have a restricted cash account. You should have a regular cash account. You should have unearned revenue account. Uh, you should have a HAP revenue account. So if you have a, you know, 14 HCC, so, you know, COVID-19 Section 8 Supplemental Fund, and you code HAP revenue into it, as soon as I see that, I know exactly what that is. You don't have to put COVID-19 in the account name. I know because you told me that fund is tracking all of our uh, supplemental for, for HCV or for public housing, right? So I recommend that you use the fund. Now, you, you might already have done the accounts. It, if it's not too hard, I would break that out and, and just set up a separate fund for those. It makes life a whole lot easier. Um, and that's that again, that's going to mirror how we input in the REACT. The REACT has the columns for every program, right? So it's a self-balancing kind of like its own company. So that's what I would do with those care funds because you're going to have to have restricted cash, match your, you know, your unearned revenue, and you're going to have to have your, your revenue minus your expenses, right? All that kind of stuff. So it, it's better just to mirror those columns, in, in my opinion, and it makes my life a whole lot easier. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, these we, we have six new sub programs. Uh, that, that, that have been added. And on your REACT, when you go in and in, do your REACT, most, most of you guys have, should have already done this uh, when you're doing your unaudited uh, for your 1231. Uh, maybe the 331s would still be outstanding. I'm not sure how many 331 urines that we have out here. Um, so that this might be new for you if you have a 331 because you still have what, a whole nother month uh, to get yours in but you have to go into the REACT, you have to create these new programs and keep track of them in accordance with PIC Notice 2020-24. So speaking of which, this is what we're gonna get into. This is what I'm gonna spend a lot of time on. So like I said, I love this notice. They did a really good job of giving examples and outlining how they want this treated. So um, they, they spent a lot of time on this guidance. So, I, and I use it, um, pretty much memorized a lot of it. So, like I said, it provides journal entries uh, for your CARES transactions and for all supplemental funding. Um, just a disclaimer, if you're, and, and we'll talk about this later, but if you're, if you use the supplemental funds to make uh, capital uh, asset purchases, there's weird accounting treatment for it. They're going to want you to do a, some, a, an equity transfer. So down in, I think, the 1040 line on the bottom of the REACT, they're going to want you to when you transfer that equity over, kind of like how if, if, you have, if you have the CFP program, very similar to that, how you have the capital contribution and then you have the, the, um, the, the equity transfer over of your construction in progress. Or, so you, that, that accounting treatment is a little weird. Um, Important ones, Appendix 1 is, like I said, you have to go in your REACT and add those programs. Appendix 1 of that PIC notice walks you step-by-step step 
of how to add those CARES programs. So um, I've had a couple of clients try to do their own audited and they just left all the CARES Act uh, stuff in their regular programs. And I was like, okay, well, obviously you haven't read the PIC notice um, and they're gonna reject it and they did. And so to, they're, they're like, what happened? I was like, okay, well, you got CARES funds and I don't even see a separate for, you know, CARES uh, FDS columns in here. So go to appendix one, go through and add, make sure you add those programs. Um, hey Doug, on that one, they, yes. you have, they have to, well, I think a lot of them miss it because you have to, like you said, you have to add, it's not there. So if you're just doing a submission, you can't do same old, same old. You've got to add these extra funds you're showing by clicking on add program. That's where they're missing it a lot of times. Exactly. You roll forwards. Uh, it, I don't know if you're going to I probably wouldn't for the unaudited, but when you create the submission, it's just going to have the programs that you had last year. It's going to have the same programs. So you have to be, you know, cognizant that I have to add these extra care programs um, uh, to my REAC. And then Appendix 2 is awesome. Appendix 2 is awesome. It, it goes through sample transactions. So it's got like seven different transactions uh, that'll go through for, I, I think it does HCV program and it does a uh, public housing program. And it says, okay, well, when you receive the money, you know, uh, this is what's going to look like on your income statement and your balance sheet. This is what's going to look like when you spend the money, right? On all those. And, and I, I actually cut out from the pick notice on my next slides, uh, some examples for you so you can see what I'm talking about here. So, um, so I know, hopefully it's not too small for your guys' screen to see these. Uh, hopefully it's uh, legible. So on the, on the left-hand side, um, you'll see what I was talking about of giving example journal entries. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have the HCV supplemental. And on the right-hand side, you have the public housing supplemental. So the public housing is gonna be a lot easier um, because there is no advances, you just draw down. Right, so um, if you're looking at the, the table on the right under number one, it says PHA incurred an eligible cost, which will be funded by supplemental operating funds. So what they're saying is, is that, you, that the housing authority is spending the money first, kind of like CFP program, the housing authority is spending the money first. So you're buying PPP equipment or whatever, right? You're gonna show it expense and AP, right? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna go into your, uh, into your ELOC system and you're going to draw that money down, right? Um, and you should set up a, a th there's extra steps in here. You can do it like exactly like this, but if you incur the cost, you should be doing an AP. And then as soon as you incur that cost, you basically made that revenue. So that's what that second part of that journal entry there is on the bottom right, is that you're saying, hey, now HUD owes us for these costs and I'm going to show revenue. And then obviously, you know, once 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 you draw down those funds or you pay that cash out, you know, you're getting rid of that AR and that AP. So uh, the accountants are going to understand that clearly. But that so 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 pretty simple. Uh, and it gives you the FDS lines um, off off to the right uh, of the potential places that you'd want to code that. Right, if there's multiple, like for the current liability, you know, you might have paid some payroll, so you put accrued wages or something like that versus regular AP. Um, off to the left, where so HCV. It is a little more it is a little bit different as far as they they paid the advances up front right so so they sent the money for admin and hap up front and then you spent it so what they want you to do is for you to show that cash as restricted and they want you to have an offsetting liability of uh, unearned revenue or like a grant advance right and then so as you spend that money then you get to recognize revenue and you get to release that that liability. So as you incur the costs, uh, you know the, your costs for your Section 8 program, your admin costs, or you're paying out the HAP. What you're going to do is you're going to release that liability in, until hopefully it's all gone and you don't have to pay anything back. Or if you do, at the end of 1231, um, 2021, if you have unearned revenue uh, uh, for your supplemental programs. For the the CARES programs, they're going to want that money back, unless they do another extension, which I I I, I don't think they will, but you never know. Um, hopefully, hopefully we're getting towards the end of of this pandemic. So, um, 
let's see here. Looking at this journal entry, so where they're going to want you to code that cash when you first receive it is going to be line your FDS line 113, which is cash restricted, right? And then a little bit of a funny thing that th they do is as you incur the cost, you're going to show you're going to show an expense in an AP, and then they want you to move the cash out of that 113 restricted account into the 115 restricted for current liabilities, right? And it's supposed to offset that AP. So your 115 is going to match any of your 300 accounts that's not unearned revenue. And then your 113 is going to has to match your unearned revenue. And unless you bought capital assets, you're not going to have and you haven't done the equity transfer over, you're not going to show any equity uh, for for any of these programs, any of these supplemental programs, you shouldn't be showing any equity. You should, if you, if you have an asset, you should be showing an offsetting liability in the public housing. Um, yeah, if you if you're showing an AR, you should be showing an AP. You're saying, hey, we haven't pulled this down in ELOX. We've and we've incurred the expenses, right? Those kind of things. So no, there shouldn't be any equity on the balance sheet. Okay, let's go back to this one really quick and, and let's talk a little bit about, so say your section eight program or your public housing program incurred regular costs, salary costs, any of that kind of stuff, general costs, any, anything that you would normally spend for the program. They're gonna go in your regular, um, whatever FDS line would you normally would code that cost to, right? Salaries cost, um, employee benefits cost, uh, general cost, any of that kind of stuff. Line, I believe it's 964. Is, is it nine? Do you know, Chad, 964 is the tenant services other? 924. 924. Okay, 924. So 924 is where they want you to code if you incurred costs for like your PP equipment and that kind of like weird stuff that's like pandem strictly pandemic related. Um, they're going to want you to code into that 924. But I mean, if you didn't spend any on any of that stuff, you just use it on salaries and, and hazard pay and things like that. You don't have to worry about that 924, but they kind of want to see, you know, if you did have to buy all this, you know, and, and setting up your office a particular way and you didn't capitalize it, it's, that's going to go in that line 924. Okay. And that's for, for, for all the, that's pretty much for all the programs there. Okay, and so this part is Appendix 2. This is what I was talking about earlier, where they walk you through uh, some of the potential transactions that you can have. And so they have this one for the HCV supplemental, and they have this one for the public housing supplemental. I'd recommend you guys go in and take a look and make sure that you're following uh, this kind of transit, because they they have whatever transactions that you you should be having also so you can say oh, okay yeah we did this let's see what it looks like on the income statement let me see what it looks like on our ending balance sheet right so <clears throat> so i'll just go through a couple of these so like uh transaction number one here hud dispersed to the housing authority fifty thousand in cares for acv admin and one hundred fifty thousand dollars in hat funds okay so down at the bottom, you have table eight, and you'll see that total funding amount, they got $200,000, right? Now, they didn't spend all of that money. So as you go down that total column there, you can see all the actual expenses that they've spent out of that, that advance, right? And so when you get to the unspent balance, that $11,000, that's gonna be your unearned revenue at year end. So that should be your restricted cash and that should be your unearned revenue, right? They got $150,000. So you can probably actually see my hair. They have the $150,000 in HAP funds right here. And if you go over here and look at the income statement, you'll see under HAP, they only spent 140 of that, right? So they got 150, they spent 140, Therefore, of this 11, 10 of it is HAP, right? 
And then it talks about some of the other transactions here that are getting coded down here for admin fees. So of the $50,000 that they received, they've spent 49. So they have an extra $1,000 in admin fees that they haven't spent. So this $11,000 you'll see over here on the balance sheet under current liabilities, unearned revenue, $11,000. And then you'll see the restricted cash other. This is FDS line 113, $11,000, right? And then here's the other thing that I was talking about is restricted for current payments, right? That's gonna match your AP. So you, if you incurred the cost and you haven't paid them yet uh, for HCC program, uh, you're gonna code it like that. So I don't see that too often. I, I usually just see the unearned and the restricted, but those, those are what's gonna to have to match up. If your React reviewer looks in your, uh, looks at this particular program and th this doesn't match, you know, your restricted cash doesn't match to your unearned revenue, you're gonna have a problem. You're gonna get rejected. If you're showing equity here, you're gonna get rejected, right? Because the total revenue is gonna match your, your total expenses for this program. So, um, Okay, so they had an equity transfer in or out, right? So this is what I was talking about for capital purchases. So this one is gonna be transaction number two. So transaction number two, the housing authority used $6,000 to purchase IT equipment to allow employees to work from home. These costs were capitalized, right? So, so you have $89,000 of revenue, $85,000 of expenses. You purchased capital equipment of $6,000. They did a transfer over to the, to the HCV program. Not quite sure why. I, I haven't really seen that very often. I don't know if Chad has, but usually you don't see this transaction number five. But ultimately you can see change in net position. There's no change in net position, right? All of the revenues and transfers in and gains are offset by all the expenses and losses and transfers out. You have zero. So therefore down here in net position, zero, right? But React analysts don't wanna see that you're coding anything to, to equity uh, for these programs. They want the money going in and out and they want the, 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 the cash to match the, the liability. So therefore you can't have equity. All my accountants know the basic accounting equation. So, and like I said, they have this exact same thing for, uh, for public housing. So Appendix 2 and Pick Notice 2020-24, really helpful. Okay, some of the, so COCC, this one's fun. I've seen people try to do this eight different ways. Um, basically, what should be happening is Obviously, everyone knows that this. Hopefully, everyone knows safe harbors have been have been raised to 50% increase, right? And additional expenses incurred in response to COVID-19 pandemic, right? If you're going to transfer extra fees over to your CC, COCC, you have to be able to explain that it was COVID-19 pandemic related. Um, so here. Out of the pick notice, they give you an example of what it's going to look like on your REAC. So you're going to have your Public Housing CARES Act, or you're going to have your you know, HCV CARES Act funds. So down here in management fees, you're going to transfer over those management fees, those bookkeeping fees, those, those asset management fees. You're going to expense them, and you're going to show them as the, the, the revenue in the 14-point CCC. CARES Act, right? These are all your access management fees, bookkeeping fees, and asset management fees that you're doing. You don't do a transfer. You don't do a transfer out of here, over into here. They want you to code those into management fees, bookkeeping fees, asset management fees. I keep seeing that this is a transfer or, or they'll do um, from, uh, from the CARES Act program over into the COCC and from the COCC, they'll code that they'll do a transfer over into um, this one, or they'll do a transfer into this one, or, or, or they'll code the expenses or revenue into this one, and then do a transfer over to the COCC. 
They don't want you doing that. This is exactly how they want you to show, show these, right? Now, once you get the revenues up here, obviously you're gonna show the expenses down below of what you're using to get on, right? And they don't want you to have equity in this program either, right? For whatever revenue that you're, you're expensing out of here and you're charging the management fees and you're getting revenue over here, they're gonna wanna see all that, all that money get charged out in expenses. They don't wanna see any net position change. They don't wanna see any equity in this program, right? And then obviously you're gonna have to do, you're gonna have to add that to your elimination column when you do your eliminations, okay? So hopefully that's clear. Um, one other, that, go, ahead. go ahead. I was gonna say the other thing I was gonna tell you, you gotta, you're about halfway in, you got 20 minutes or so. Okay. Well, I'm doing pretty good on time then because I don't have a whole lot more. This is where, really what the meat of what I got into. So um, good. Just, just so you know, if you charged uh, management fees, uh, additional management fees to the capital fund program, they want you to code that in other projects. So, you know, you have AMP1, AMP2, and then you have other projects. Well, guess what? They want to see the, the CARES management fees for the CFP program coded over into the other projects. So that's a little quirky thing that, that, that I, I learned uh, a few weeks ago. So I'm trying to keep that in mind that that's where they're going to want to see those CFP management fees that are above uh, uh, the allowable, the, the safe harbor ones. Hey Doug, I'm back on that one. Yes. Oh, I'm not back on that one. You want to make sure you tell them that um, that 14 point CCC doesn't have the 707 lines available, even though they tell you to put it there. Oh yeah, I think I think that the the pick notice talks about that. Um, I forget where. So which line are we coding this to then? So you got to put the 715 because if when you do add that program, in HUD's you know great knowledge. It's unable to add 707 line. It's only available in the COCC. So that's you got to right. put it to line 715 because that's the only thing it will populate with. There will not be. So I don't want anyone to be confused when they go to do this. You know, that this is what it shows you. You're supposed to be putting it on these 707 lines, but there will not be a 707 line in that CCC. That's right. Yeah, and there's no lines, I think, for um, what would it be HAP revenue versus admin revenue. And any of that stuff, right? They don't correct. They couldn't get that in there either, even though that happened. Even though this yeah. notice tells you to put it there, um, yeah. so just so they're aware that that you know don't get confused. Yeah, I completely forgot about that. Yeah. All Period of availability, like I was saying, we have until 2021 to spend the money. Um, it was extended from the 2020 uh, calendar year end. So might get extended again. We we got to see what happens. So, but as of right now, that's you have until that date to 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 expend all those all those funds sitting in your e-locks and and uh, that's sitting in your unearned uh, revenue right now. Okay, CFA presentation. So this is one. This is a fun one that me and Chad got to talk about quite a bit. So um, this is off to the left. You'll see kind of my recommended. This is. This is the way that that I would do it, but um, there's a couple of things that you have to do uh, when you report these. So, if you see over here, we have the 14871 Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers, 14871, and then you have the COVID-19 Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers, same CFDA number. HUD already said they created the 14 HCC, 14 PHC, all of those. That's just supplemental for their tracking purposes. That doesn't mean that you have a new program. And if your auditor is, if your auditor is treating it like a separate program when, when they're doing your audit, that's not correct. Those, those supplemental uh, CARES funds need to get added to whatever program that is when they're figuring out what's your type A program, what are your major programs, when you're presenting it on, on, your, uh, on your CIFA, they want you to put COVID-19 in front of the program name. So you'll see it down here, COVID-19 mainstream, same program, just we're reporting it so that they know that it's the supplemental CARES funds that are coming in, right? 
and I'm to, we're totaling here. So the total for 14871 is this 43693. And this is, this is what your single audit should be based off of uh, when they're doing the single audit planning. So I don't know how many auditors that we have out here or um, anything like that, but this is how your CFA should be doing. So hopefully, I don't know how many of you are preparing your CFA either, but if, if your auditor is preparing or your fee account is preparing it for you, make sure that they're putting the COVID-19 in front, that they're showing the same CFDA number and that they're totaling these programs. Um, very, very important. Um, yeah, so, so like I said, HUD said no new, there's not gonna be any new CFDA numbers. Those 8.8 CCs, those aren't real. They're just using that for tracking. Um, and you have to indicate how much on the CFA was, was COVID-19 related. HUD's gonna want it um, when, you, when you report it on your clearinghouse, which I'm gonna show you in the next slide, they're gonna want that information too. Okay, so anyone that does clearinghouse submissions, the SFSACs, um, what you're gonna do is in the, in the award input section, you're gonna have your regular award. So right here, this one's TANF. And then you're gonna put the supplemental as, an, as a separate award, same CFDA number, same C CFDA number, but you're gonna, in the additional award identif identification section, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to put that is for COVID-19, right? So just like how you did here, COVID-19, COVID-19. And ultimately these, these will all add up and, and total what's, what's, on your, what's on your CFA, right? But you don't wanna include this number inside of here. You wanna separately report that um, so that's pretty simple. All right, so this is one of the one of the few pick notices that came out in 2021. Uh, it's the 2021-08. It's got some care stuff in it. It's um, talking about housing choice vouchers, mainstream vouchers. One of the things that it does talk about is the uh, submission dates. So. Is letting you know that hey, we're going back to the normal submission dates. Um, we're not we're not granting the the three month extensions or any of that kind of stuff. They're going back to the normal uh, submission dates as far as we can tell until another pick notice comes out and they say, well, the pandemic spread and now we have to delay again. But uh, as far as going forwards, we're we're back on to the normal schedule. Uh, quarterly reporting, quarterly reporting. So. They said, <laughs> I forget which pick notice that by October 1st, uh, 2020, they're gonna have this quarterly reporting uh, all up and running. And if you received over $150,000 in CARES fund, you're gonna have to go into that quarterly reporting and report all of this different information here. Um, but as of right now, there's no system set up. Uh, we've talked to a few of our guys on the inside of HUD, and they are so backlogged with React right now, they're not even thinking about working on this system. So as, as far as we know, and, and by the time they do get it back up, or, or they do create the system, you know, there's going to be no more CARES funding to, to, to track. So, I mean, who knows? I'm leaning on the side of, I don't think we're even gonna have to do quarterly reporting, but that's just my opinion from, from what I've heard from our guys at HUD, the, the people I've talked to, is that that system isn't gonna come up and running. But I'm not, I'm not saying that it won't, I'm just saying it doesn't seem likely that it will. So I just wanted to put that out there because obviously as an auditor and I work on a lot of REACT schedules, I'm like, okay, well now we gotta do this quarterly reporting for all our clients. Well, it's not looking like we are, but we could, so I just want to let you know that that update. And so that concludes that concludes my presentation. Um, so if we have any questions, I'll be glad. Me and Chad will be glad to answer them. Regards, cares, acts. There's no questions yet, but we can give everybody some time to type their questions in and submit them. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Minutes. And that stuff Doug was going through is real technical. And I know it's really nitpicky, but that's what the reviewers are doing. That's what we're seeing them reject on. They are picking on stuff like he was saying. 
moving in between one restricted cache to the other restricted cache, they will reject on that. It's insane, but um, you know, you think, oh, that's just really nitpicky, but um, whatever we can do to avoid rejections. And I would say that rejections overall are just up, period. They are, I don't know if it's because they're working from home, they got more time or what, but they are rejection happy. Absolutely. So you follow Doug's guidance, you'd be given less ammunition, basically. Doesn't look like we have any coming in, but let's just give it a little bit longer. And uh, if not, um, we can wrap up early. Um, all of these slides are going to be provided to you. So I know a couple of people were interested in getting the slides. I'm going to send them to everyone who attended. Um, same with the recording. Um, the recording um, will be posted online. I'm not going to email out the recording but <laughs> when I send you the slides. So I guess the only other thing I would say on a comment on is um, I know HUD from our discussions, me and Doug with them, is that they're looking for you to spend this money up. I would not be looking for an extension on it. They want the money spent. They want to go for another round of money. Um, you know, they keep authorizing uh, different bills and stuff like that. If they haven't spent the money and you haven't shown them they spent the money, then they can't go get more money. So they definitely want you to get this money used up. I mean, Doug might be advising the same as I advise most of my clients is just charge salaries to it, you know, get it used up um, and, and leave your HAP admin fee or leave your public housing subsidy um, to flow through to equity uh, because you can, but uh, you can't do that for this CARES fund. Spend it up, use it up. Don't save it for a rainy day. There's no rainy day coming. <laughs> and they will take it back. So I can guarantee you that's why they're making you put that in that unearned revenue account because they will take this money back. Well, I guess Doug did a really good job because he's got no questions. He must answer all the questions for everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's some people out there that, that are like, man, I've been trying to get my own audited React or my working on my audited React and get that to work. But um, if you just go into that pick notes and you download it, if you, it should give you a pretty thorough explanation. And if you have any questions, you always can reach out to either myself or Chad and we'd be help, happy to help. You know. Yeah, we've done that. I mean, you can also probably do a one-year contract with us just to be your unaudited react for a lot of ours. I know a lot of um, small fee accountants, uh, they didn't offer it to us, but the, the housing authority just got tired of being rejected for the fourth time. So they just said, can we just pay you and, and get that done? And we'd be happy to do that for one year. We're not going to try to steal the fee accountants work, but, you know, to make sure they add those programs and, and fix them. Yeah. And we could, if you're getting rejected for any reason, we've we deal with Reacts all the time. So we've seen all the different rejections. So we probably can figure out what they're talking about pretty easily without even having to go into your trial balance system. As long as we can see what your, what your React uh, numbers are, we could probably fill it, figure out what's going on. So that's something else that we can help with. And that's 80% of the problem is just figuring out what they want. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say I never missed any of those items. I mean, we've been rejected for the same items same as we missed them sometimes, but um, Half the problem is figuring out what do they want and resolving what they want. Make sure you attach your comments. Um, anybody who's submitting rejections, attach your comments, tell them what you did. I guarantee you they will be much friendlier to you than if you don't attach comments. If you just resubmit, you can fix everything. It's still gonna take them off. Um, attach the comments and say what you did to fix the problem. All right, Hannah, I think we can let them go early. I don't see Yeah, let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, I just wanna, you know, huge thank you to Paul and Maria. Um, we, you know, love working with Tara. We love um, presenting at your guys' events. Um, you guys are a really good group. And so any chance we get uh, to get involved with anything you're doing, we're excited to jump on it. So again, just huge thank you um, to Paul and Maria for making this happen. And Doug and Chad, thank you so much for presenting today. Um, and attendees, I will be sending you the slides and the recording um, tomorrow. So everybody, you have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye.